I have committed. So there is him, prisoners and murderers. He's done terrible wrong, but he's found God through Jesus. And he's got, he's got happiness. He knows he's got his child, isn't that right? And there was another one, a woman in Algeria. That's northwest Africa, isn't it? Uh, a very a, a, a Muslim country, an Islamic country. And she said that her husband has banned her from going to church because he thinks that's wrong to be a Christian. So he's simply not going. But she secretly believe, reads the Bible at home, she says, quietly, secretly, probably when he's out. And it says, Psalm 46 touches me especially, she says, especially that God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So when she reads her Bible, she finds help from God, that Christian woman, uh, quietly does it. Uh, different parts of the world, people finding that God speaks them through the Bible, and Jesus can come to them and, and, and give them life, set their lives on light. Just as he set our lives on light, hasn't he? Folks, that's what he does. Now, I want to go to the Old Testament of the Bible today, and on page 271, if you've got this, uh, this, this Bible here, this blue Bible, 271, we're in Old Testament, first book of Samuel. So we're going back 3,000, 3,000 and 100 or so years, something like that, a long, long time ago. And after the Jews have come out of, of slavery in Egypt and they're, they're settled in the land, it's before they've got, they've got kings yet. Um, uh, they're, they're not part of the nation yet. Okay, I'm reading uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1. And, you know, the Bible has got fantastic stories. They're about life. They're about real life. It all real life is in the Bible. Actual events happening. Things that happen to people. People like us. When you read the Bible, especially if God's Holy Spirit gives us power, gives us inspiration, then we find ourselves in the Bible. We find people like us. And we find God coming and meeting people like us and accepting us and, and working in us and doing things for us. Uh, God and us together. And here's, this is a human interest story. You know, sometimes newspapers, uh, local newspapers, they say to the, the journalist, get us a human interest story. Something that will make us think. Something that will touch us. Here's a human interest story. There was a man from Ramathin, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim. I'm on one Samuel, the first book of Samuel, chapter 1, page 271. Uh, his name was Alkana. I won't tell you all the people he's so not, because there's a lot of complicated things, but look at verse 2. He had two wives. It was okay in those days. One was called Hannah, and the other, Penina. Penina has children, had children, but Hannah had none. Now that was jolly hard for Hannah. Now her husband loved her very much, but she couldn't give him a child. She wanted to give him a son. Every woman would like to give her husband a son if they can. And she couldn't do it. And the other woman was giving him plenty of sons. And Hannah felt lousy. She felt dreadful. I'm a failure. How can my husband keep loving me? The husband said, look, I love you. I love you. Not plenty. She said, yeah, but I'm going to give you a son. And then um, <clears throat> she, she got desperate. And they used to go, the Jews used to go up to the temple in Jerusalem every year. For, the, for a, a, at least once a year for a big celebration. A big festival. A big religious festival. And up they go, uh, Alkana and, and, and Hannah. And it says, verse 10, while they're in, well, sorry, not Jerusalem, they're at Shiloh. So it's before Jerusalem is the capital, I'm getting muddled. Uh, they're in Shiloh before Jerusalem has been taken, taken over and become the center for the, for the Jews. They go up to Shiloh. Um, and they go to Shiloh, in verse 10, they're, they're at the Lord's house, they're at the, tem they're at the temple of the shrines, uh, the religious place in Shiloh. And it says, verse 10, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. So this woman was deeply distressed. And she made a vow, she promised and said, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. That was this way of saying he'd be a Nazarite, a sort of group that, that said, right, we will dedicate this child to God and, and, and let his hair grow and long beard and, and you'll never touch alcohol and all that sort of thing. But she said, well, give me a child. Uh, please, Lord, give me a child. And uh, I'll give it back to you. Now, um, 
Verse 12 is interesting. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Now, Eli is the old priest. And he's been the priest operating for God out of Shiloh for years and years and years. And it says in verse 13, Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk. He thought she'd been, you know, she'd been on the ale. And been gone over the top. She thought she had, yeah, I thought you'd have a skinful. Now, a lot of you have had a skinful. A lot of people have had a skinful. And uh, he thought, here's another drunk person. And you know how people can, if you've been drunk, and people pass you, and how they look at you. How they look down at you, you're drunk, drunk at them, they've got it. Some people have been there, I know that. Um, and Eli, the priest, thinks, oh, was another drunk in the temple, too. And he says, put away your wife. How long are you going to stay drunk? When are you going to stop this drinking? When are you going to clean up your act? Put away your wine. And she said, oh, no, not so, my Lord. Verse 15. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer or vodka or whiskey. No, she didn't say that. She hadn't been drinking wine or beer, but she hadn't been on anything. She wasn't on anything. She, she said, I'm deeply troubled. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. I, I, was just, I, was, I was so upset. I was praying so hard. And you thought I was drunk. But I had just been giving myself in prayer. Uh, she says, 16, do not take your soul for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of great anguish and grief. It's my pain. The pain is awful because I want a baby. I'm going for a baby. I want a child. And that's why I'm crying like this. Verse 17, Eli, the old priest, he's probably sorry then. Oh dear. Oh dear, I've said the wrong thing again. You don't like that. Oh heck, I've said the wrong thing again. Why well, do I keep putting my foot in it? And Eli, the priest, realised he said the wrong thing. He's had a go at this woman when he should have been coming alongside and putting an arm around her. Yeah? Hope they're like that. Sometimes rather than having a go at someone, I hope you come and put their arm around them and say, come on. Anyway, now, he's learned, he's learned. And he answers, oh, okay, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked for. So he says, oh, yeah, sorry, I realise now it's wrong. I pray, pray that God will give you what you, whatever it is you're crying for, what you're praying so deeply for. Now, I don't know what you're praying deeply for. But some of you will be praying deeply for something. I hope you are. Because God wants us to cry to him. Tell him, pour it all out to God. Don't pour it to the next day. It want to help sometimes. But much better, pour it out to God. And then you may hear him say, go in peace. And I'll grant you what you've asked. Anyway, um, off she goes. Now, um, let's move on a bit because I don't want to be too long. Verse 24. Um, uh, verse, verse 20, sorry. So in the course of time, a little bit later, Hannah became pregnant and she gave birth to a son. What did you ask God for? And she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. That's what the name, word Samuel means, because I asked God for him. Yeah. Now, verse 24, sorry, we're jumping a bit, but we're just, we're following a long story and just trying to pick bits out. Verse 24, after she was weaned, she took him, and she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ether of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. They're the offerings. They brought offerings to God. When he was weaned, you know what that is? When he stops coming off breast milk. Now, the boy will probably be about three, or a little bit over three then, because you had to keep breastfeeding them a long time. I mean, there, was, there wasn't any powdered milk, was there? You know? And if you had milk, if someone expressed milk, you've got no fridge to put it in, have you? Yeah, so they kept feeding them, breastfeeding them for as long as they could. And it would be three, three or so years old. And as soon as that, then the boy's not dependent on the mum any longer, is he? So this little three-year-old boy, she's got, she's got a problem now. I said to God, if you give me a boy, I'll give him to you. So she's got a little boy, I mean, a bit younger than that one there. And... <laughs> she's promised to God. And she must have said in the heart, well, I wish I hadn't promised. I wish I'd said, um, Lord, if you give me a baby, I'll, I'll teach you to pray every Sunday. You know, it would have been a lot easier. But she had 
Lord Jesus, I'll give them to God. So when he's three, she goes off with a bull and other things to sacrifice to God. And she takes him to the temple. And she says to Eli, the old priest, verse 26, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live. I am the woman who stood beside you here praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he should be given over to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord here. So she does what she's promised. She keeps a promise to God. And I think that's very moving. What a woman. Sometimes we pray and get what we want. We forget about God and what else we say. Because we've got what we want. She did. She said, God, you've, given, you've done this for me. You've given me the way I long for. I'll keep my side of the bargain. And she brings it. And, um, it's, and leaves him there. Leaves him there. Um, and I think it's very touching. But um, she goes, now where's my reference? She goes up. Um, verse 18. Chapter 2, verse 18 now. Every year they went up, as I said, to the festival. And she goes up now without the little boy. Verse 18, but Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. That means he was serving in the temple, as a little boy, and with, a little, with an apron on, a sort of religious apron as it was in those days. Verse 19, each year his mother made him a little robe or a little coat and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Every year, she'd make him a coat a little bit bigger, and a bit bigger, a robe, and a bit bigger, and say, this will fit him this year, and she'd take it and give it, to remind the little boy how much she loved him. And how hard it'd be, lovely to see him, but imagine it going away again. But she did that for God, and she left the boy to work for God. She wanted her son to be serving God, and working for God. Verse 20, Eli, the priest, would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying that, that Samuel's mum and dad. May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So Eli, having, she prayed for one son, she's got him, she's given him to God. Eli then prays for her. And God gives her more children. Boys and girls blesses her. God likes to bless us, you know. You might think God was hard taking the little boy. But this was the best thing. This is part of God's plan. Samuel was going to be used by God in a wonderful way. But God, the mom doesn't really miss out. She makes a little, she makes a sacrifice. It's hard. She gives the boy to God. But God blesses her the ways. Now, I wonder since you've been a Christian if you found that. If you give anything up for God. Okay, it hurts a bit at the time. But have you found that God gives you back more? He promised he did that, he said that. Anyone who gives up home or wife, family or anything for my sake in the gospel will receive a hundredfold in this world and in the world to come eternal life. Constant blessing. Yeah, God takes. God takes sometimes. Sometimes God takes from you. Something that you cherish, something that you, you want, something that you, you're desperate for. And God says no, when he takes it. But he doesn't take to hurt or to humiliate you. He takes, he will always give more. He blesses. He's into blessing. At the end of her life, Hannah didn't look back and say, I wish I hadn't given the boy away to God. No, she thinks, thank God. Look what you've done. Bless me and the children. Look what you've done through my boy. Now, what did you do through the boy? Chapter 3. We've got 10 minutes left. Chapter 3. Uh, this is a famous chapter. The boy's son who ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Not many people were hearing much from God. It was a bit like our country today. You know, the vast majority of people aren't hearing much from God. Closing our ears to it. It was a bad time. There wasn't much happening there. But one night, verse 2, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, he's getting on in years, uh, was lying down in his usual place. The Lamb of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. The ark of God is the symbol of the presence of God amongst his people. And the little boy Samuel is probably there looking after the ark of God, making sure perhaps nobody gets in there. And um, the Lord called.
Paul summary in verse 4. And sometimes, and here I am, and he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. They must have waited in the old priest's office so there, and there, what do you want? And the old fellow said, What? Oh, what? Oh, what do you mean? You called me. No, I didn't. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. And he sleeps a bit, or tries to. And then he hears again, Samuel, Samuel. And he rushes again and says, Here I am. What am I going to do, sir? To, to the old priest. He says, Go back to bed. What's the matter with the others? I was trying to sleep. I was having nice dreams. Why did you make me up? No, he didn't say that. But anyway, he just said, Go back. And it happens a third time. And the third time, Eli twigs. And Eli twigs that God, Almighty God, is speaking to a, a little boy. And Eli says to him, uh, we're in verse 9, Eli realized the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in this place. Now I wanted just to take you back to verse 7, because in verse 7, after God called a couple of times. Verse 7 says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So the reason Samuel didn't know that it was God speaking, because he didn't yet know the Lord. He didn't yet know God. This, of course, is the amazing claim for Christians. And I know it's a claim that some people around the world find it hard to understand. And most people in this country find it hard to understand. But Christians know that God speaks to them, that he communicates to them, that we can know God. Like you know your wife, or your husband, or your child, or the neighbours next door, or your friends, but better, we can know God. Now it says here, verse Samuel 7, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. That means there was a time when he didn't know God. Didn't yet know the Lord, but he's going to soon because God is shouting, Samuel, Samuel. So soon he has got to experience God in a powerful way. Now that's the position of people in this country. To start with, we don't know the Lord. When I grew up, I didn't know the Lord. I was baptized. My parents took me to be baptized. They were Christians, but they thought they had a nice thing to do. That didn't make me know the Lord because I had a bit of water on the forehead. I didn't know. I went to Sunday school a bit. And a Christian youth to but I didn't know the Lord. I knew a bit about God, but I didn't know the Lord. I was at the church this morning, early on. Uh, I'm worried that there's people in that church that didn't know the Lord. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure the vicar didn't seem to think that God really spoke through the Bible. Otherwise he wouldn't have been pulling it into little pieces and saying you can't believe this, you can't believe that. But it's Christian experience that God does speak. And God wants to bring us to the point where, from where we didn't know him to where we did. Now that's happened to a lot of people here, hasn't it? There was a time when you didn't know the Lord, yeah? yeah. And there was a time when you did know the Lord. So what happens to Samuel, what to Samuel has happened to, to many of you. And that's wonderful. And the Christian offer is that you can know the Lord. Christ died so that we might know, so we can know him. Better than, better than the closest thing. That's the wonderful thing about Christian. Samuel wasn't there yet, but a third time the Lord called Samuel, Eli got up and went, um, Eli says to Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and I bet he was shaking, I bet he didn't go to sleep again then. Because the old priest had just said, God, the creator of the universe, it's going to call you Sam. Because he wants to speak to you. <coughs> and the voice says, Speak, Lord. So, um, verse 10, the Lord came and stood there calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. God just says the same thing. He doesn't have to say anything else. It's just the same thing as you said, Samuel, Samuel. And this time, Samuel knows what to do. And Samuel says, Speak, for your servant is listening. Now, 
That's a great thing to say. Uh, really, that's what I want to say this morning. Wouldn't, I think we should try and be like Samuel. I think we should be people who lie quiet sometimes, like he went back and lay on his bed, or go in our room and sit down quietly, no telly on, no, no music on, nothing stuck in our ears, and just sit there and maybe say, speak Lord, for your servant is listening. Because we believe God is our Lord, and we should be his servants. Now we're his sons, and we're his friends, because we've been singing, I'm a friend of God. But we should also be his servants. We're here to serve him. We're here to serve God, to do, serve him, and serve other people through him, by him, by the power of his Holy Spirit. So we can hear learn a huge lesson from Samuel. We can go and lie down, or go and sit down, partly, and we can say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. It's what the Bible, in the way, teaches us. To be like, we could be like Samuel. God used Samuel amazingly. They had a good time to say all he did, but one of the things is he anointed David to be king, King David, who was a forerunner of Jesus himself. And he, 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 he led the country for God for years, Samuel. But it all started when God called him, and he, he, he heard the voice, Samuel, Samuel. And when he was wise enough to do as the old priest had said and say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Now, if we're, if we're going to do anything for God, and he wants us to, we've got to be willing to say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And uh, it's all here in the Bible, and I know, I know some people don't find it very easy to read, so I was talking about, we're always, so I'm always talking about the Bible, and the Bible says we study this. Now, I know some people find it difficult to read the Bible. Uh, but even if you just catch over one verse now and again when someone's preaching like this, or, or, or it's for catch over one verse, and, and catch over that, catch over that one, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. After you've had a hassle day, or you feel you're far from God, or you've let him down, go and just sit quiet and just. In the quiet, sit there and say, speak, Lord, for, for your servant is listening. And wait and see what God says to you. Wait and see what he speaks. You might hear his voice. Actually hear it through your ears. Or he might just put something in your mind and your heart. And you'll know the way ahead. But that was Samuel's way of making himself available to be God's hands and, 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 and feet and God's mouthpiece. And to work for him. And it all started with him hearing God and saying, Speak for your servant is listening. So that's probably all I've got time for this one. But could we remember that? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And ask him uh, what he wants us to be doing for him. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Oh, oh. One, two, one, two. Don't worry, the food's coming. You wouldn't believe this, Graham. I had, did I have any idea what you were going to say today? No. no. Guess what? I read, I read First Samuel at the start of the week. Guess what my prayer's been all week? Speak, Lord, for your soul is listening. Yeah. Isn't that a royal Thank you, Graham. That is brilliant. Thank you. God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Okay, before the throne of God, remember we have a high priest whose name is Jesus, but it says his name is Love. That's Jesus, isn't it? So we have a high priest we can come before the throne of God above. It's 1187. Just one, once we finish this, I'm going to get um, Kerry Ann and Prashanti. Is that okay to come up? And we're all going to pray for them. Is that right? Yeah, after this? Do you want to do that? And then um, perhaps Gail, you can come up and pray for them. Would that be all right? And then we'll give thanks for the food. And then what you do is you just go up and uh, you'll get served. So this is 1187. But yeah, that's just me too now, isn't it? I want you to. Before the throne of God, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great happy.
Tuesday, Bible study, and then next Sunday we do the same thing here at 1 o'clock.